in deference to those who uh, I have not had the opportunity to meet yet, and uh, uh, I'm Michael Wright. I'm your guest uh, preacher today uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I was with you five weeks ago for three weeks. You can do the math on that and figure it all out how long ago that was that I first was with you. And I want you to know when I was asked to come and uh, preach again, I was very excited about it. I loved uh, being with your congregation all that time ago and uh, was am excited to be here with you today. I thank God. I thank God. Uh, today, uh, I, we are going to be in the book of First Peter. While you're turning there, I'll finish introducing myself. Uh, my wife and I have been married. We're going on 41 years now. We have two. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, praise be to the Lord. Uh, we have two grown kids, four grandsons, four-wheel drive grandsons. And we, uh, we love them. We love family. Um, so uh, I was, I'm blessed that uh, my wife said, yeah, go, go down there and be with those wonderful f folks. She was with uh, us uh, on, the th on the third Sunday that I was with you. She was here on her birthday. So we enjoyed celebrating with you guys on that particular day. Today we're in First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 3. And uh, the main thought for today and next week, it's a two-part message. But I'm going to preach three main points, one today and two next week. So you're going to have to come back to get part two. That's just the way it is. That's the way we, we do things, right? But the, the theme, the main thought is harmony in a hostile world. Harmony in a hostile world. We live in a hostile world. We see this all the time, where we are, and even in the news, right? You've seen what's happening in Israel. Israel being bombed by Hamas. I think there have been over six or 700 deaths already. Um, it's, uh, we need to pray for Israel. I pray for Israel. And I do so because of what God said to Abraham at the beginning of the nation of Israel. God told Abraham that, that he will bless whoever blesses Israel. And he will curse whoever curses that nation. When I think about what God has said there, and I think through all of history, you know, that, that all took place 4,000 years ago. Of course, 2,000 years ago, Christ comes. It was through that nation that our Messiah has come. And now, here we are 4,000 years later, and we are worshiping the resurrected Jesus Christ. But I think about the history of Israel and all that have come against Israel. None of those nations have been prosperous. No nation has been prosperous that has done war with Israel. Think about that. Also think about this. Think about how many of us have planned a vacation in these nations that hate Israel. Have you planned a vacation recently to Iran? Have you planned to go to, I mean, unless you're a missionary, like our brother and sister here, have you thought about going and, and, and vacationing in Pakistan or Afghanistan? No, because they are in, they are in chaos. They are at war, not only with Israel, but they are at war within their own hearts. They too need the gospel. That's the only hope for Hamas. That's the only hope for unsaved Jewish people. But until the Prince of Peace is Lord over all the hearts, there will always be this chaos. The question for us as believers in Jesus Christ, is what is our responsibility? How are we to behave in a world like this? Well, this is what we're going to see in 1 Peter. And before we get to verse 8, let me just, just simply kind of go over what brings us to verse 8 of chapter 3. 
Because when you read 1 Peter, you notice several wonderful things. One, that, that Peter calls the people the elect exiles. If you have the ESV, that's what you see, elect exiles. He says, you are elect. You are chosen by God. You live in a very difficult place. In fact, you, if you look it up, you'll see that these exiles, the dispersion, uh, the, uh, they lived in, in Asia Minor, a very dangerous place. The ruler of Rome during this time was Nero. It is believed that Peter wrote this letter to these people during that reign. Nero was an enemy of Christians. Maybe not for why you think. But Nero decided he wanted to rebuild parts of Rome. The way you, in those days you might rebuild parts of Rome and, be, and get your name on the side of a building is you might burn buildings down. And that's exactly what he did. He thought the people would love him for it, that he was bringing urban renewal to Rome. But they did not. And so he devised a plan to blame Christians for the burning of Rome. And so what happened with that decree is that people then began to arrest Christians and summarily execute them. And they were, there were all kinds of horrible, torturous things that happened to the people in Rome and in the area. And this is when Peter writes. He says, Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. And so Peter, what he does is he comforts these people who may lose their life at any moment with the fact that they are elect. They are being held by God. In fact, he goes on to tell them that they are, they are saved. They are being held by the Father through his foreknowledge. And that they are saved through the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. So that they would be obedient to Jesus. And he goes on to say, and you are sanctified. And in other parts of scripture, the Bible tells us that we are also sealed by the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about that? All three have something to do with saving you and then holding you and not ever let going, let, never let going of you. Isn't that marvelous? Well, if you were a persecuted believer, this is good news to you. They were elect exiles. They were called exiles because they didn't, this home is not the planet earth. They're called exiles and things just don't quite feel right. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever, have you ever gotten up during, in the morning or maybe sometime during your day and you go, know, things just don't quite feel right here on planet earth. Would you like to know why it doesn't feel right? Because things aren't right on planet earth. All right. We live among the God of this world, little g. And he's blinding the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the glorious gospel, which is Jesus Christ. You and I are exiles. We are not home. Home is heaven. And it's not here. And the more we try to make it here, the worse it gets for us. We get disappointed if we put our, our hope in that church is going to be heaven or that our family is going to be heaven or anything else. Listen, friends, God has not created anything to take the place of Jesus Christ and heaven that he's building for us. All right. So you are an exile. I am an exile. And if we know the Lord, we are elect being held by father, son, and Holy Spirit. That brought them encouragement. And that's what Peter did. He also tells them that they are going to suffer trials while they're here. That there's going to be a testing of the faith. 
But not to worry because this heaven that God has promised is being guarded by God. It's being guarded by the power of God. Which means for you and me that it, no one is going to be able to break through and steal your salvation or steal your heavenly home. And that's what he tells them. He said, you're going to face trials of various kinds. That word various in the Greek means multicolored trials. And trials do come in various forms. Sometimes they're, they're just irritations. It's like turning on the gas oven and you, you just got that soft, warm little glow there on your, on your stove. And then sometimes it's a blowtorch that'll cut you in two. And you think, I don't know that I can survive. Well, Peter tells them that they are going to go through trials so that it can be tested. That what tested? The faith can be tested. The, the genuineness of your faith to God is more precious than gold. And so God must take your faith that you have placed in Christ and test it and, and purify it so that what comes out of that is glory and honor and praise of the Lord. Because nothing else will be left. Someone asked me about the American church this past week. They asked, well, what do you think the American church needs? Because when we look at first century church... It's nothing like the 21st century Americanized church. And my answer was this. Persecution would help the church. You say, that's crazy. I can't believe you're saying none of us are going to pray for persecution. None of us are going to pray for trials. But trust me when I say that the church in China, for example, who faced persecution and the threat of death aren't having the same conversations about church life as we do. We worry about the time we're going to start our services and the time we'll end them. That is the worship, the gathering, or the types of songs. If we come to the early service, we're going to get those good old hymns. We come to this service, we're going to get those good old praise songs. And by the way, I noticed some of the dates on our praise songs, they're, all, they're getting old too. I don't know what anybody uh, you know, gripes about when it comes to, to music, by the way. I remember seeing a, a cartoon of two ladies, two older ladies sitting on the front pew. And one lady looked at the other and said, I don't know what to be upset about. You know, the, the, the hymns on the screen or the praise songs in the hymnal. I don't know which one. Well, the church at China is not worried about that. The church in North Korea is not worried about that because they may die at any moment for praying, for reading, for sharing, for singing, whatever it is that they do. That is what they face. I wonder if we were under persecution, we might be able to, with that fiery trial, purge away all the fluff that we think is so important in our lives. I, I think we probably would. And we would narrow it down to the non-negotiables. Now why do I share this with you? I'm sharing with you to give a feel. For this. What Peter says. To the believers in the first century. Because if we get a feel for it. We'll understand why he says. What he says. That's why in verse 13 of chapter 1. He says prepare your minds for action. Set your hope. Not on how great the service can be, but put your hope on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where the hope is. The hope is, will Jesus come? And when he does, what will our lives be like? Set your hope on that. The apocalypse, the revelation, when the curtain draws back, will we be a church and a people that please God? Now, let me ask you something. This is a rhetorical question, so you don't have to answer it. Please don't. But if you were to grade yourself on your faith, your, your, your walk with Christ today, what would it be? 
Would it be an A? Would it be an A plus, A minus? Would it be B, B plus? What would it be? Or maybe it would be a failure. You say, I just haven't walked with the Lord. I think that's a good question to ask because at the revelation of Christ, that, 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 the answer to that question is going to be made known. Right now, we're able to hide just a little bit. Put on that happy face. Put on that, that, that kind of walk that makes it look like that we are the people of God and nothing ever goes wrong. When the reality is, is that maybe there's a lot going on and a lot going wrong. And so, let's come to these verses. Because just before, by the way, just before we get to 3.8... Peter does something very interesting in his writing them. He says, now church, you're under persecution. You're the elect. You're being held. You are exiles. This is not your home. You're dispersed. Some of you are living where you are because of persecution. But while you are where you are, he gives these three things to be subject to. The first one we see in chapter 2 and verse 13, where he says, be subject to every human institution. The word to be subject also means submission. Submit to every human institution. And if I can just make it simple and quick this morning, I would say, we as believers ought to be the very, very best citizens in our, in our city and in our state and in our country. We ought to be the very best. We shouldn't be known for doing evil things. For if we do evil, it's going to end up in the news. And it's going to end up with somebody saying, see, those Christians are no different than anyone else. They, they speed. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. They, they, they park in the handicap. No, I shouldn't have said that either. What well, they, they, you know, they do all of this stuff. They bad mouth when they're out in the community. We've heard them. Those people over there, not at Calvary, but some church down the road, they do that. And it becomes news. And bad news travels fast. So the apostle says to these persecuted believers, whatever you do, be submissive to governing authorities. Pay your taxes. Drive responsibly. Be humble in your community. Don't draw attention to yourself in a negative way. Secondly, he says, be subject to your masters. That is, go to work and be good employees. Do what you're told to do. Don't badmouth your boss. Don't talk behind his or her back. Don't do that. A Christian is disciplined and is able to walk with the Lord in very difficult circumstances. And then thirdly, he says, be subject to your husbands. He says to the wives. And then he says to the husbands. And live with your wives in an understanding way. Paul calls this being equally submissive. One to another in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at that. And how I would love to preach Ephesians 5. But not today. Because what we do in the home. Probably speaks more about who we are. Than anywhere else. Because we can tend to look good at work. And look good in the community. But we're not so good at living uh, submissively and being uh, in submission one to another at home. Are you with me? All right, stay with me because where we're coming now is the meat of what we wanted to share here. So in chapter 3, verse 8, the Apostle Peter says, finally. Now he's not ending the letter. He's coming to the end of the argument about submission. To governing authorities, submission to your, your, the people at your work, submission to one another at home. And now he says, okay, church, finally. And he, he uses here in the ESV, he says, all of you who are under persecution, you're all exiles, all of you have unity of mind. Now, I love the New American Standard Version. I started using it as soon as I became a Christian. The Lockman Foundation came out with the New American Standard. It's, it's considered to be one of the most accurate versions in all the Bible. 
Then in 2001, Crossway Publishing uh, came out with the ESV. It is equally good and accurate. It doesn't matter which one you use. You may have another translation. You might have NIV, or perhaps you have New American Standard. But it, these two versions are considered the most up-to-date, accurate, and reliable versions. Don't change just because I said that. I just wanted you to know that I like the New American Standard in this text for a particular reason. And I, I, hopefully you have on the screen and you do a comparison of the two. On the left side, you have the ESV where the Apostle Peter is, says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind. On the right-hand side is the New American Standard, which says, To sum up, all of you be harmonious. Well, which one is it? Am I supposed to have unity... Or am I supposed to be, as a believer in the persecuted times, harmonious in the body of Christ? You want to know what the answer is? Would you like to know? It's both. And man, all the, the scholars that I looked up, they, they say it's both. And I'm going, this is wonderful. We are, to we are to have unity within the body of Christ, but not lose our distinctive giftedness, and personalities as we, as we praise the Lord together. So that is why I look at this word harmony. Because that word literally means that. When I think of harmony, I think of music. Don't you? When we were singing a while ago, I was thinking, wow, I hear, I, I don't hear unison. I hear people singing in harmony. And you know what harmony is? If you go back to your early days, you know that harmony is about, is about uh, singing different notes, sometimes a third apart. I think I might have even shared this idea with you one of the sermons last time I was with you. But as a reminder, you know, harmony usually is sung in like in thirds. I, th I, thought, about, I thought about getting you to sing during this time. But then I thought, well, you've already done it. And we already heard it. Some of you were sing, singing beautiful harmony in thirds. The one, the three, the five. And, and there it was. It was expressed. Not all of the sentences that we see up on the screen uh, are given to that perfect third of harmony. But in basic, in basic music uh, ideas, that is exactly what it is. It's harmony. And I love harmony. When I was a kid, I grew up with groups that sang harmony. Maybe some of you did as well. And when you have really good harmony, it does something. Now think about this. You have a, you have a choir and they're all singing one note. And it's wonderful. It's beautiful. They're all singing the same note. Maybe an octave apart. Eight notes apart. And they're singing. But suddenly there comes a point in that peace where, where harmony is brought in. And now you have bass and you have, you know, tenors and you have second tenors and baritones and you have sopranos and you have all of this going on. And, and suddenly you get goosebumps on your skin. You're going, whoa, that is awesome. But when a choir or a band or a group does that, they're always doing it in time. It could be four, four time. One, two, three, four. Or it could be in thirds. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. It's a different feeling. And music is written with that in mind. By the way, I think there's going to be great singing in heaven. And I think it's going to be the best harmony we've ever heard. And I'll just throw this out for free. That, um, that when we, when you look at scripture, it depends on the, 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 the translation you have, but I don't think angels sing. Now, new American, new, new NIV says, yes, not new American. And the angels did say for to certain poor shepherds in the fields. 
Now, some translations say sing, but in all the background I looked at, angels don't sing, they say. Now, what they say and what they said to the shepherds, for example, might have sounded like song because they were so in unison. It, 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 was, it probably was absolutely, tremendously, powerfully wonderful. But I think God has given music and singing to the redeemed. And if you think about it, we're practically the only group in all the planet and world who actually sing to their God. There may be chants and there may be all kinds of other things, but we, we write music, we put it in notes on the sheet of music, we, we sing it and we sing loud and we like to bang cymbals and we like to uh, play guitars and, and, and hit on the piano and all. We like to do that because we want to bring a glorious praise to the Lord. Well, Peter says, hey, you, you exiles, you, you people that are under persecution, be harmonious. Don't be a clanging cymbal. Don't be a, a gong. And if you'll notice, when it comes to singing in choir or band, there are no soloists. When I was in fifth grade, my music teacher, Miss Martin, taught me along with our, our class, how to sing as a choir. And she used to say, now here's the way you do it. When you sing, listen carefully to the person on your left and listen very carefully to the person on your right. I'm doing it your right, you see. Do that and don't sing louder than them or softer than them. Be unified even in your harmony. And as I've grown up and, and learned that practice, that's exactly what Peter, I thought about this, this is what Peter is meaning. Be harmonious. Don't be the loudest person in the room when it comes to being in God's church. Don't be that one who clamors for attention, who gripes and complains and is always the person when they, when, when they step in the room, don't be that person where everybody goes, oh, here comes so-and-so. They're about to say something. And they're not singing the notes. They're not singing along with the capital C conductor. They've got their own thing going. Can you imagine that happening? While we're singing our praise songs that somebody says, I'm not singing along with that. I'm going to sing my own notes in my own time and do it my way. All that will do is bring disunity and dissonance, disharmony to the body of Christ. Are you with me? You say, well, we're, we're supposed to do that now? Yes. But again, ask, ask the persecuted church if they uh, have any thought of not being harmonious. Oh, I'm sure there's somebody who complains even in persecution. Did you know that there are, over, there are 10 to 15 people every day in this world who lose their life simply because they're a Christian? 10 to 15 church buildings or Christian buildings in our world are being destroyed every single day in our world. They don't have time to think about getting their own way. They only have time to think about getting, doing things God's way. And so this is why we see this. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time on that. This message today is, is, can be chopped off at any time because I'm going to come back and bring the other two points in. But let me, let's just go through it. He says, be harmonious. And then he uses the word, be sympathetic. That word sympathetic is an interesting word in the Greek. It means to have the same feeling. Well, how do you have the same feeling? Well, this requires intimacy in the body of Christ. This requires me sitting down with you and you with me and you with each other, taking time for each other to find out what's really going on in life. 
I, I teach a men's Bible study. Yesterday, I had a man in our study who said, hey, my son just wrote us a note and said that he's gay. You see, that raises, that raises, for me it did anyway, the compassion and sympathy for what those parents are going through and what that young man might be going through. Another man said that he had a a dislike for homeless people. He couldn't, he really can't stand them because he thinks they're just lazy. But that's not always the case. Sympathy might say, hey, tell me your story. And find out that he was abused as a child. Was th- had to run away from pain. And ended up in one orphanage to another orphanage or some halfway house to another halfway house. But it takes, it takes the body of Christ saying, I care enough to stop doing all of my selfish stuff to have a coffee with you, to have a lunch with you, to write notes to you, to be with you, and to hear your story. That increases my compassion and sympathy, which is exactly what Peter is saying to the persecuted church. Listen to one another. Zip the middle hole up and open up the two on the side of your head and hear what people are going through. Be less concerned about singing your note, but listen for the note of someone else. What is their song? What is their story? You see, this is really quite amazing if you think about it, that in a persecuted church that they need this kind of instruction. But it's obvious that they, they did, or it was a warning that they avoid the opposite of these behaviors. He goes on to say, and also be, be sympathetic and be brotherly. Have this characteristic. Be brotherly. And to be brotherly means to have, to realize you're all in the same family. I have two brothers. We didn't always get along. And uh, in fact, when we were young, we probably, my parents probably thought, well, they never get along. But let me tell you something you could never do. And you could never bring harm to my brothers. That's when, that's when that, that ended. When they were under some sort of trial or someone was coming upon them. What we need to realize as a body of Christ is that our brothers and sisters are under trial. And we don't have time to be anything else but brotherly and take up for our brothers and sisters. That doesn't mean we let them go in sin. In fact, fact, it is unloving to let someone remain in sin. But we never, we never shush them. We never push them away. We try to keep them as close as we can for as long as we can until it is no longer possible. And then to be humble in spirit. Now let me finish with this. Verse 10. He says, not, do not repay evil for evil. That's what Gentiles do. That's what the lost world does. That's what the NFL does. (laughs) That's what, that's what uh, people do that are against one another. But he says, on the contrary, bless. Now, I'm using ESV on this one because he says, on the contrary, comma, bless, comma, stop right there. He goes on to say, this is what you're called to do. God called you to bless other people, not to bring blight, not to be a bother, but to lift Through blessing. Who needs it more than the persecuted church? And who needs it more amongst a people like this who all have their own private and yes, sometimes public trials? Bless. Bless with a word of encouragement. Bless. Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works. Bless. Let us encourage each other day after day as long as it is called 
today. Don't wait till tomorrow. The person who needs your blessing today might not make it till tomorrow. And you're the one to give the blessing to cause them to go on a little while longer. He says, bless. This is why you were called a blessing. And he says, do it so that you may obtain a blessing. Now, I realize uh, that some of you might say, well, well, Pastor, I have been, I've tried to be nice and people are still so mean. Well, this, this text is not saying bless and everyone will be, will be nice to you. Okay. In fact, you might irritate somebody with your blessing. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? In the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who, who, uh, who are hungry and, and seek righteousness. Didn't he say that? But he didn't finish the sermon there. He went on to say, oh, and by the way, blessed are those of you who are persecuted for my name's sake. What Jesus was trying to tell the people is if you act diametrically opposed to the ways of the world, you're going to irritate the world and they're probably going to try to do something against you. And so what we see here is Peter saying, hey, be a blessing. You are called to be a blessing. You may not get that blessing here, but you'll get that blessing there. You will be rewarded. You say, nobody sees me being nice. Don't worry. God sees you. God sees you being a good citizen. God sees you being a good employee. God sees you in your home and you think no one else has seen what you're going through. God sees you. And God sees what you're doing in the church. And he will reward you for being a blessing when there is no other blessing to be found. Be that person. This is God's word for today. Let me close with this thought. I believe that the home is probably the best place to start blessing. Then work your way out from there. Be a blessing to your spouse. Say a good word. Pray. Encourage. Be a blessing to your children. They're probably already all freaked out by your worry. So be a blessing to them. Be a blessing to someone at work and someone in this community and start by doing it today. In fact, this is how I'm going to challenge you. Think of someone that needs a good word. You say, well, I, I need the good word. A little, little tip for you here, a little spiritual tip. You give a good word, God's spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you did a good thing. Somewhere you'll say, I did what the Lord wanted me to do, even though I didn't get it in return. But be a blessing to someone today.